Welcome to Discipleship Week 12. I'm sorry to be away, uh, but I'm enjoying some time with my family as we remember the life of my grandmother. And I know uh, Chris Shanks is helping out this morning and he will hashtag dominate. Uh, thanks for doing that, Chris. Um, last week, we talked about making disciple makers, uh, teaching others to teach others to teach. And uh, how'd you do on your homework? Um, did you reflect back on some of those spiritual key moments in your life? And what did you learn from that? I hope that you saw how uh, discipleship played a key role in those moments and that you can reflect back on that and learn uh, a lot from those moments. This week we will be looking at unseen fruit, the legacy of our faith, um, enduring even beyond our lifetime. Have you ever asked yourself uh, this question, you know, what difference am I really making in the Kingdom of God? Uh, you know, is God really using me uh, to make an impact for Christ? Uh, these questions have crossed my mind many times, uh, especially after I've made a mistake or missed an opportunity uh, to share God's love. You know, it's real easy for us to focus on the present. I often joke with the teenagers, uh, long-range planning to them is what do I have planned for the weekend? But even as adults, uh, we struggle with planning uh, in the long uh, range or the distant uh, future, especially when it doesn't include our own lives um, in the instance of generations to come. But we can learn from those who have gone before us. We can learn by uh, their example and we can prepare for the future generations that are coming. It doesn't come naturally, uh, but it does come with intentionality. Let's look at what Paul uh, writes to Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3-5. through 5. I thank God whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. From this passage, we can see that Paul learned from his ancestors and was preparing for the future, a future that did not include him. Today, I want to share three stories with you uh, that will illustrate the power and importance of evangelism in the world and discipleship in the kingdom of God. These stories will hopefully help us to see the value of Christ's servants, us, not only in the present time, but for generations to come. This house is where I grew up. I lived with my, my mom, my dad, my two sisters, 
my one brother and my grandma. This is school I used to go to, uh, Melinda C. Jones. Uh, so it was a big school from, it went from elementary to middle. Had a lot of friends here and uh, we had a lot of lockdowns because people break into school, you know. This school is, haven't been rebuilt since Katrina hit New Orleans and that's been like five or six years now. It was uh, kind of scary living living in New Orleans because I used to hear gunshots. I mean, we got used to it. We used to be outside playing football and then hear a gunshot and stop for a minute and get back to it, you know? It all started when, when New Orleans was hit by Katrina and made us evacuate to Houston. And when New Orleans hit Katrina, nobody really believed it. Everybody just kind of ruled it out because the last hurricane just went right past. So everybody took it as a joke. But Katrina, when Katrina hit, we had to go to the Superdome, which was not a good place to be after Katrina. There was a lot of uh, violence. There was... Uh, kids being missing, like parents actually walked around with, with a poster with a picture of their kids on the posters and it says, they're going around with a poster and it says, have you seen my kid? We all stuck together as a family, we all stayed together. Uh, the guards at the gate was getting mad at us, you know, they started shooting, they sh started shooting in the air just to get us to calm down. Everybody got on the ground, I mean, it was it was hot. They had to drop us water from the from the helicopters, uh, they, and they used helicopters to cool us down. It was so hot. They used helicopters to come down on us, and we and we used the wind from the helicopters' uh, uh, wings to uh, calm us down, uh, to cool us down. We finally uh, a bus finally came and got us, and then we had to then we evacuated to Dallas, and we lived in a convention center in Dallas for like I don't know how I don't know how long we left we was living in there but then we finally got a house in Dallas and lived there for a year and then we moved to Houston We had lots of kids come in through our to our church uh, from Katrina, and many of them uh, they didn't really behave as well as uh, some of the kids that grew up in the church did, and so there were some issues there. Some of the parents were kind of anxious about having these kids that were different in their in their classroom with their kids, and um, there was some tension there. But one lady in particular, uh, Mary Chapman, uh, took an interest in them. And she really encouraged uh, these kids uh, to come to church and to be a part of the ministry there. She, she just invested in them in a way when uh, no, no one else really uh, wanted to take an interest. We ended up putting a program together. Um, Steve, this third person, Steve Wynn Bigler, was really good at the idea. What we need to do is 
this. And so we kind of added to that program and refined it and made it into something where we could reward the kids when they demonstrated good behavior instead of, you know, shushing them for not. Um, and then we decided we not only needed to reward them for individual instances of good behavior, but for patterns. Wow, you've done this for four weeks in a row. Woohoo! You know, you get the extra recognition. The three of us who work with the kids started really noticing that Albert was quite the leader in his own quiet way. He was not only a leader, but he was very passionate in what he believed. He was very passionate about getting to heaven. We would talk amongst ourselves when the kids were gone and say, that Albert, he's quite the evangelist. And so that became, it wasn't something we told him, but it became something that we just, amongst ourselves, it's like that Albert, he's quite the evangelist, because he was continually making God part of his life. A lot of the people that we've had here uh, in the youth group are because Albert invited them. No one asked Miss Mary to, to help us and to pick us up, but she did, and I'm thankful that she, she did pick us up and start bringing us to church because Memorial has influenced me to be a better person and they influenced me to get up in front of the church and lead, uh, uh, to lead uh, prayers and lead songs and even lead a sermon. And that all fall, falls back on Miss Mary helping us uh, helping me get to memory and get to get more involved with the youth group. Albert prepared his first sermon for the last LTC event and he did really well. He got some special recognition at LTC. But more importantly than that, when it is the youth did the service, they led the service one day with what they had prepared for LTC. Uh, as a result of Albert's preparation for his sermon, he ended up baptizing his father. The day he baptized me, you know, I mean, my wife had talked, I told him, I think I want to get baptized. And, and he, he baptized me, and then I wanted to change get all my sins washed away and be be a better elder, be a new elder, you know. And um, things start changing, you know. Everything start getting better in my life. I just want to be a better person than what I've been in the past. I saw my dad come up to get baptized and I baptized him. It was, uh, it was one of the best days of my life. Since I've been in Houston, every close friend I know have been a memorial. You know, a lot of people think it's just uh, tough to invite your friends to church, and uh, Albert just seems to make it pretty simple, you know. He just says, hey, I'm going to church. He just invites them, and it's something that he enjoys and something that he's passionate about, and so he doesn't hesitate to, to ask his friends to be a part of it. Uh, it's nothing scientific or some deep spiritual question, he just says, hey, you want to come to church with me? And uh, he usually gets them there to play basketball in the gym. You know, they start out by playing some basketball and, you know, kids just connect. They, he brings his friends in and they connect with more with him and with other kids in our youth group. And, um, and then God uses those connections to eventually bring them to a point where they're ready to make a faith decision. And uh, so it's not some deep, scientific, hard process. It's just just a simple question. Hey, do you want to come with me to church? See, Katrina influenced me in a good way and in a bad way. The, the bad way is that, you know, we, we was homeless for you know, probably a week. We spent three days in the in Superdome, which was like the 
worst place to be doing, like after Katrina. But the good part was coming to Memorial and, and being with the, with the youth group that we have. You know, uh, I'm, I'm real, 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 real closer to God uh, at Memorial. You know, it's amazing to see how God works through horrible things. To see Him work in this horrific event, this bad situation, to bring so much good to uh, His church and to these people. Uh, one kiddo, his name is William Townsend, only lived here a little while, but in that time, Albert invited him to church. He became active. He was baptized, and by the time he moved, he left a Christian. And, and that was because of Albert. Uh, I was so glad to see the growth in Albert's life. And the growth in our youth ministry because uh, he came our way and I'm just excited to see where God will take it from here. Uh, it just really brings to life the scripture uh, Romans 8 28 and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And One of the things that I see with all of these kids is they're all connected. You make one association and you bond with that child and they bring others and you bond with those and they bring others and it kind of like feeds on itself. It's incredible uh, the things that can happen when you take time to look outside of yourself and to watch Albert uh, not just focus on him, himself but to look around at his friends and see that they have a need for Jesus just like he does. And to really lean into them and in, encourage them in their faith to, to find Christ and to in turn see them leaning into their friends. Praise God for servants like Mary Chapman Nugent who took the time to minister to kids like Albert and the other kids that came to us from the Monte Carlo apartments after the disaster known as Hurricane Katrina. Albert is now a student at Oklahoma Christian University and he has brought many people to Jesus in his lifetime. Um, the ministry that Mary started, the Great Kids, is going strong still after 11 years. We have 20 plus kids coming to us every week to learn about God. And the amazing thing is that neither Mary nor Albert live in Houston right now. But the ministry, the work that they started, still carries on. You know, I grew up in Longview, Texas in a neighborhood on three streets. Uh, there are about 85 homes there. And back in the 70s and 80s, there were kids running all over that neighborhood. We had lots of friends uh, in the neighborhood playing in each other's homes and yards. And uh, we had some good friends that lived down the street that also went to church with us. Bill and Jan Howard and their daughters, Wendy and Laura. And one summer, when I was real little, my mom and Jan decided to uh, host a neighborhood VBS on Fridays. And they would teach us a Bible lesson and serve cookies and red Kool-Aid. And that was a big hit with all the neighborhood kids. They taught us all kinds of lessons. We learned about Jesus. We learned about Abraham. We learned about Moses. Uh, a couple of lessons that I remember very well. One was when we learned about Jonah inside the belly of that fish. They taped a bunch of trash bags together and hooked a fan up to one end and it inflated into a large fish and we all climbed in the belly of that fish and learned 
how Jonah was in there for three days. And probably my favorite lesson was uh, David and Goliath. Uh, my mom and Jan drew a big picture of Goliath and they taped it to the side of the house and they let us throw rocks at it. Um, that was so much fun and we all had a blast throwing rocks at a poster on the side of the house. Um, and you can see the picture of that Goliath here uh, in this photo and uh, that's me in the Batman shirt with the cutoffs. Uh, Wendy uh, Howard, that's her in the black shirt with the asteroid on it. And Laura, her younger sister, is there wearing the cowboy hat. And over on the left in the striped overall shorts is my good friend Braden Hosel. And uh, I'll talk more about him in a little bit. And after the summer was over, uh, my mom began studying the Bible with some of these mothers of these children. Uh, they knew she was a Christian because she had been teaching a VBS in the neighborhood all summer, and so she would ask them for Bible studies. And one lady in particular, Debbie Hosel, Braden's mother, uh, took an interest, and she began studying the Bible with my mom. Now, she had become knowledgeable of the Scriptures, and she knew the truth. And one morning, my mom got up and went over to her house and knocked on the door, and she said, Debbie, you know the truth. What's keeping you from becoming a Christian? And Debbie said, you know, I, I'm ready now. And so she gave her life to Christ. She was baptized into Christ. And not long after that, her husband Harry also became a Christian. And the Hosels had six kids. Todd, Scott, Brayden, Addie, Rebecca, and Katie. And as they grew up, they all became Christians as well. Later on, Harry became an elder in the church. And all these kids grew up and they married Christian spouses, and now they have families of their own. If you look at this picture here, you can see that there are 29 people in their family now. All following Christ are being raised to follow Christ as they grow up. Uh, my friend Braden, the one from the picture earlier with the striped overall shorts, he's on the far left with his wife and his four kids. You know, Braden uh, is a minister. And a long time ago, he was a youth minister at Impact Church of Christ, working with Paul Woodward and the, and the kids down there. And when my mom passed away in 2012, Braden sent me this note. Your family is in my prayers. Your mom shared Jesus with my parents when I was just a little boy. Her love and courage changed my parents' lives, and through their changed lives, the course of my own life was eternally changed. In John 15, 16, Jesus says that He was, has appointed us to go bear fruit that will endure. The fruit of your mom's life is enduring, not only through your family and Andrew's family, that's my brother, but also through my own family. What a blessed legacy, Braden Hosel. Jesus calls us to bear fruit that will last, even beyond our lifetime. Now let's listen to another incredible story that demonstrates this kind of fruit. Well, I feel sorry for you. You have to hear me in the worship service, and now you have to hear me in Bible class too, but only for a few minutes. Since Mike is out of town, he asked me to make a little video about how we share our faith with people, and it impacts more than just the moment, or even just the person, but possibly generations and continents and other nations come to hear about Jesus because of what we do right now. And I think of a, of a story that I, I've been researching for quite a while now about a, a man who was an elder down here in South Texas in Gonzales County by the name of J.W. Baker. And somewhere along the line, in, around 1883, J.W. Baker not only was an, el was an elder, but he also preached a lot. He was in, in Gonzales County, and he, uh, he baptized a man by the name of J.S. Newman, in 1883, who could barely read and write. He was a young newlywed when he was baptized, but J.S. Newman started studying the Bible. He obviously learned to read and write, and he became quite the preacher and preached all over South Texas and in some other places too. Well, J.S. Newman, one of time he was preaching in Montgomery, Texas, just north of Houston here. And in 1917, as he was preaching away, there was a young man in the audience by the name of C.E. McGoy who decided to be baptized that day. And in 1917, this man, J.S. Newman, baptized C.E. McGoy. 
C. E. McGoy became quite the preacher himself, actually preached at McGregor Park, an old congregation that used to be here in Houston. Preached in Oklahoma, preached in several places. And C. E. McGoy in, in the late 1940s was holding a gospel meeting, a revival as we call them sometimes, in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. And there was a, a young family in the church there. The man's name was Charlie Gowen. And Charlie was listening that night in the gospel meeting and decided to be baptized himself by C.E. McGoy. Well, Charlie didn't stay working for Halliburton very long. He got transferred out to northwestern Oklahoma, to Woodward, Oklahoma, a little town. Got out of Halliburton, opened a furniture store. And in 1967, Charlie was, was uh, taking a public speaking course called the Dale Carnegie Course. And the graduate assistants in that course that were helping with the speaking course were my parents, Raymond and Avis Duncan. Charlie, just a member of the church, not a preacher, not an, not an elder, never was, asked my parents if they would like to study the Bible with him. And they said yes. And they were not an easy case, let me tell you. It took a long time, more than a year. And finally, my parents were baptized into Christ. Well, in December of 1979, by this time my dad had become a preacher, in December of 1979, my dad baptized me. He baptized lots of people, but I was the last person he ever baptized before he died. And then, as time went on, I decided to go and become a preacher and go to college and study Bible. And I married Barbara. And we went to Brazil, and we were missionaries in Brazil for seven years. And we've, I've had the opportunity to baptize several people, but I think about one man in particular that I had the opportunity of studying with and baptizing in Brazil by the name of Ezonel. Ezonel is just a poor man, lives in a rough neighborhood, like you've probably seen on television from Latin America. And Ezonel, uh, after I baptized him, about a year later I was there when he baptized his son, Mauricio. And you know, when I think back about that story, and I go all the way back to J.W. Baker, he probably couldn't have even found Brazil on a map. I guarantee you he didn't think that his story would be told in a, in a, by video in a Bible class in Houston because video hadn't even been invented yet. But when I think about the story that Mauricio was baptized by Ezonel, Ezonel was baptized by David. David was baptized by Raymond. Raymond was baptized by Charlie. Charlie was, was baptized by C.E. C.E. was baptized by J.S. And they must have just had initials in those days. And J.S. was baptized by J.W. What an incredible story. And now Annabeth, our oldest daughter, who's in class today, is about to marry a, a preacher herself. I just think about if someone along the line would have decided it wasn't important to tell the story of the gospel. If someone would have broken that chain, where would I be today? Where would, where would my kids be today if someone wouldn't have shared? When we share the good news of Jesus, we can change generations, we can change continents, we can literally, through, the God, through God's help, we can change the world for the good. You know, God is providing daily opportunities for us to share His love and His message with people in the world. It can be so easy to miss these opportunities because of our own busyness or because of our lack of compassion for other people. You know, we'll never know the true impact of our faithfulness to God. However, it is obvious from these stories that God does amazing things, even in the smallest of moments of our lives. He works in us to change the world. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Your homework this week uh, is on the sheet in the back. But also, 
it is to go into all the world and be that light. Share God's love and His truth with other people and let your faithfulness uh, bear fruit, fruit that will endure even beyond your own lifetime.